Kingdom Central is at the Breakthrough Energy Movement Conference. We have the proud pleasure of speaking to Dr. Judy Wood and Andrew Johnson, who has joined Freedom Central previously live on our radio show. Thank you very much for giving us your time today. I understand this conference is very busy. Um, first thing I wanted to ask you, um, Dr. Judy, you've taken on a lot of um, information which you've put out to the public um, with regards to 9-11. Let's start with how that has impacted your life. Well, I like to keep it about the evidence. Okay. And rather than, you know, martyr stories, and, you know, I've, I've seen that. too much of that, and so that's why I like, the evidence can stand on its own. And so that's why I like to just keep it with the evidence. Okay, fair enough. I think there's something, you've got a little bit of that information about uh, that on the website in terms of, uh, you know, if you want to find out about Judy's, uh, background uh, academically, that's all yeah. on there. But um, since then, uh, you know, it's been more focused on actually uncovering 9 11, hasn't it? Yeah. And what's what's mm -hmm. happened there? I mean, we do, we do, you know, you do get asked that question, don't we? But to uh, tend not to dwell on it that much, really. You know. Okay, fair enough. Um, let's move on then, uh, more directly. The information you've put out is quite uh, controversial, which, and it's, you know, your evidence is very um, what much there. What do you mean controversial? Um, not from my point of view. There's a lot of people, and I've listened to a few clips where I've had where people have called into radio stations and really gone at you because they've got a different understanding of what the real story was, you know, nanothermite and whatever. Um, you deal with it very well, but it's obviously because you know your facts. When did you start uncovering things about 9 11? I discovered on 9 11 that you know, the story wasn't as advertised. But for me, when I, my eyes and ears don't agree, I just turn off my ears. And I look with my eyes and don't hear. And so I wasn't hearing what I was being told to see. I was just seeing what I saw there. And it wasn't what other people were being told to see. So the story wasn't as it was advertised to be. Um, but I figured the grown-ups were going to take care of it. <laughs> you know, I have my work to do and someone else's job. But it became clear that nobody else was going to do it. No, that it wasn't being done by any official agency, and the grown-ups weren't going to take care of it. Uh, there's having to do with the presidential selection in 2000 when it went belly up, you know, the votes flipped. We can't fix this election, but we'll fix the next one. Well, the next one came, and the flip was even worse. That was in 2004, and that told me the grown-ups weren't going to fix it, and they weren't going to fix 9/11 either. So that's when I really started getting active in it, um, but doing my own thing, and... I think you started to post stuff actually on, on the web page then, because you were discussing it with one or two people. Right. So that was when the sort of first web page started, I mean, about 2004 was it, or 2003? Uh, 2004, Four, yeah. and, and I uh, anonymously also posted on a forum, the billiard ball uh, thing. And I think I first came across your name in probably in around about 2004, 2005, and I'd heard somebody at some blog somewhere say that this professor, Judy Wood, had actually taught engineering problems in class related to 9-11, and I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> uh, but that was, I didn't, that, that was, I think, 2004, 2005, and I haven't often spoken about that, and I, do, and I don't always remember to mention that I'd seen your name on a blog. And in fact, I don't know if you were named then, but it, I think, Looking back now, you, they must have been referring to you because you're the only person I, since getting to know you, that uh, actually took it into the classroom where you were working. I've never heard of anyone doing that. You know, in other words, these characters that came along later in this scholars group, they never said, "Well, you know, I, I've, I've actually put this to students in class. This problem of the towers going away, you know, and, and presenting them with these options, which is what you did, isn't it?" In some of your classes. Uh, Right. No, not the, the huge thing, was it? That you sort of right, like uh, the strength materials class. Uh, they just learned about what temperature does to steel. I mean, how can you forego that one? Uh, so, as a as a kind of an attendance quiz, you know, they get it right just being there. I gave them this multiple choice quiz. That all right, you're gonna have, you're gonna heat up a pot of water. You have, you, over a campfire, and you have a wad of old metal coat hangers that you use for grill. You put the big pot of water on it, and I have a picture of it, and as you heat the coat hangers, you know, the fire starts heating up, what's going to happen? Multiple choice. Check all that apply. 
and the first one is nothing, and the second one is the pot slowly starts, you know, easing downward, and the third one is uh, suddenly without warning the coat hanger shattered into little straight pieces and go all directions, and the next one is uh, without notice the coat hangers shatter into into dust and the pot slams to the ground, and by then you hear the students chuckling when they get down to that one. I made my point to them. <laughs> yeah, they realize the ridiculousness. They know what, what temperature does to steel. It softens it. It causes the pot to, you know, if, if it's not strong enough, it's going to start easing down. Mm -hmm. As the metal gets weaker, loses strength, starts yielding at a lower temperature, it's going to start sagging. Maybe it probably won't even stay straight. Yeah. It's not going to turn into dust in midair. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's a key point, you know, that people trained not to see and they're trained not to see that both by all the Al Qaeda stories on the news and, then, and you know what what we've documented between us is that people in the 9-11 truth movement also don't want you to focus on the aspects of the building turning to powder and they, whenever you try and do that they'll try and say well it's probably not that it's probably something else it's probably this or probably not that so this is one of the starting points that I think certainly myself, Judy, brought me to that, that starting point of the new, the new understanding. I, I call it a new understanding of what happened on 9-11. And, and that is what people in the 9-11 Truth Movement don't want you to go into. Well, both of you um, have been fundamental in um, educating me as to what happened. Um, obviously, um, examined both the information uh, on separate occasions. Uh, it was actually Dr. Richard Hoagland who introduced me to your information at the... He's um, not a doctor, by the way, but I know he me. Ah, sorry, I'll say he's Richard Hoagland, yes. And his uh, lovely wife, Robin Felkov, who's an absolute angel. Um, but th they introduced me to this information on behalf of you. Um, it's trying to, to um, put it across, and to be honest with you, the way you've put it across is it's somewhat different. For example, you didn't hear anything uh, about the tornadoes or the weather conditions when Richard put this information to us. Um, but well, that comes later, after mm -hmm. you first have to see the evidence that's there. And you, that's one of the biggest problems I've noticed that people have, is they like to jump to the answer. If you jump to the answer, you jump to how it was done, you have to assume what was done. Mm -hmm. How it was done, well, what's it? You have to first define the problem you're solving in order to solve it. You have to determine what happened before you can determine how that happened. And so I've been very uh, strict with that, with the audience here. Even though we're short on time, I won't jump to the, the answer. I need people to understand the evidence, because once you understand the evidence, it falls into place for you. Mm. Okay. And it, is, it is quite difficult because it's th that way of thinking is not something which, you know, it's taught in, in what, what I would call real science. Real science is the process of gathering the evidence and working out exactly what the picture is, and then you can start to put together some type of explanation for what that picture is. You know, you don't start with, well, uh, it looked like it was this, and then look at the, all the evidence and match it to the picture. You've got to really put the explanation on one side until you've got all the information. You know, and it's the same as the way the court cases would be fairly addressed. You know, you'd gather all the evidence and then you'd make a case against a group or a person or a group of people, and then you take that to court. You, know, you, don't, you don't start by, you don't, in the first thing in court, well, we think you did it. Oh, oh hang on, let's, let's go out and get this information from so and so. We'll get all the witness accounts tomorrow, you know, and we'll have the old witness accounts ready for tomorrow, and then we'll be able to nail you. You don't do it that way, you go and get the witness accounts or whatever it is first, and then you take it to court. So it's perfectly logical how you, how you do it, but in the conspiracy movement, a lot, a lot of that gets bypassed. This is one of the problems. And you get caught up in all these different sort of scenarios that are possible. Very few of them actually, you can say with certainty, that's what happened. And again, I've found with Dr. Wood's research, this is where it's different, because if you actually look at what she's put there, and you follow the methodology that she's essentially laid out with, alongside that, then you're, you can be in no doubt as to what happened. Uh, and you don't, there is no need any longer for debate. And, and, then, and then that in itself, psychologically, it can be, become something of a dis disappointment for people. Oh, well, so we know what happened now, so what do we do with that then? You know, they, they kind of like, 
because there is no debate. Yeah. yeah, there's nothing to do. You know, you've got you've got to you've got to what actually happened. So you know, you can move on. Um, and that, so it's very important that, that people understand that you, you have to establish what happened using the evidence and then go from there. One thing I've discovered in this is why cover-ups work so well, or how they work so well, which is if you get people to focus on how it was done, how it, before you define what it is, how it was done, well in order to do that you, you're assuming what happened. So yeah. pretty soon you're just solving an imagined problem, not a real problem. So people have opinions about what about what was used to do what or you know how it was done, and this person has an opinion. They just argue about opinions round and round and round circles and never get anywhere, and you can never solve it that way. And I mean, one of the classic examples of that. I mean, we were discussing this again earlier today. It always comes up is that when you you know when you've presented that the buildings have turned to dust and you go through all the evidence, the, the first question which a lot of people will come up with: What about the planes? What happened to the planes? Uh, and as Dr. Judy rightly uh, says... Let, let me, let me do, do my number here. Uh, well, I, I say planes can't turn buildings into powder in midair. Real planes can't turn buildings into powder in midair, and neither can fake planes. So it doesn't, the planes are not an issue. But, but people get stuck on that because they've had all this, these stories about planes, both from the news media, and they say, well, what about passengers? What about families? And they need answers to those questions. And they can't dissociate the plane story from the building story, and, and, and they can't say, okay, well, but you know, most people can say, well, I'll just forget the planes for now, and we'll just focus on the building. It's very, very difficult for them to do that. So that then becomes a distraction. Uh, but you then have to, going back to this, you know, solving a problem, and what is the problem? We can establish now from Dr. Judy's forensic studies what happened to the buildings. It is still unclear what happened with the planes. If you again, if you go down that path, you can establish certain things about the planes, but it's certainly much less clear what the true story is of the plane. You know, what actually happened with the planes is much less clear than what actually happened with the buildings. Um, but there is still information there that you can that you can grasp onto uh, if you want to do that. And that's and I think. Uh, because we've got much more information about, you know, some people might, for example, say we don't talk about the Pentagon very much. And there's a very good reason for that, because there weren't as many witnesses, there's not as much video evidence, there's not as much seismic, there's no seismic evidence from the, no, from no the Pentagon. Official report. There's no official report, we haven't got the 10,000 pages of reports, which some of which, some of the information in those reports is accurate, certainly. Um, and uh, it's probably worth mentioning. I, 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 you know, one of the things we, that, uh, again, Doctor Wood brought to my attention a few years ago, is the timing of those reports, because um, the technical reports to explain what those were, they were produced by NIST, um, and NIST means the National Institute for Standards and Technology. It's a U.S. government agency, and they were given a mandate by the U.S. Congress to produce technical reports, supposedly to do what Dr. Wood has done to explain In terms what of happened. How the towers to how the towers were destroyed. Yeah, but the title of the report was the collapse of the World Trade Center. So they already assumed that they did collapse. When, if you look, if you look at the evidence, as we mentioned earlier, they did not collapse. They turned into dust into midair. So the the whole title of the report was already in of itself rigged to a certain outcome. Um, and um, those reports, there were ten, around 10,000 pages, and you can download all those reports if you want off the NIST website for free, you know, or you can ask for them on CD. And I did indeed, I, we, I think we both downloaded all those 10,000 pages in PDF files, so you can do keyword searches and stuff, and there's a lot of interesting stuff in there. And those reports came out, in, I think in August 2005, was it August? Uh, September. Was it September, was it? September 15th. September 15th, all oh, right, I thought it was August. Or it was maybe the end of September, but yeah, in September, I think. Right, right, okay. And so, 10,000 pages of reports, pictures, data, tables, analysis, blah, blah, blah. Somebody's going to be looking at those reports. Somebody with a scientific background, you know, is going to be looking at those reports critically. And they're going to see certain things in there, and you can see certain things in there, like steel with stress patterns on it, which you cannot explain by a conventional collapse or anything like that. They're going to see that. So you need somebody to manage manage that, and that person appears to have been Steve Nee Jones, physicist from Brigham Young University. 
And, you know, we, I, I was later sent a video about him and he's then connected into the cold fusion research. So, which, which is an energy phenomenon. Um, and that's, that's something which... He has a lot of the same symptoms. Yeah, yeah. And so, you can see, again, starting from the evidence, how the perception of that evidence has to be carefully managed. And I think the difficulty for people, and this is what I've talked about a lot more, is understanding the trouble to which those that did 9-11 have gone to, uh, to to manage this perception. I mean, it's one thing to put all the news networks, the, the Al-Qaeda story and all that goes with that on the new, news networks, but how about, you know, as you said, as, as Dr. Wood has said on many radio interviews, if they planned 9-11... Did they just they, forget to plan a cover-up? Did they just forget to plan a cover-up? You know. Jeez. So the 9-11 the, the, the Truth Movement was planned along with, you know, the, the event itself. It happened. Build it and they will come. Okay. I, it, I call them a collection agency. They collect people to keep control of them. And you'll find, you know, pilots for 9-11 Truth, uh, lawyers for 9-11 Truth, medical professionals for 9-11 Truth, secretaries for 9-11 Truth. Uh, you know, Firefighters for 9-11 Truth, and doctors for 9-11 Truth. Yeah, you know, there, there's a... It's kind of like a different flavored fishing lure. Yeah. It's not that the people in that group are going to do anything or do anything differently. It's just, uh, oh, there's my group. I need to go go join it. And again, you find that with a lot of those groups, um, that what they'll do is, particularly with the well, architects and engineers group, they, they for example, say, that, well, they're collecting names, as that's the one goal. Um, but uh, they're also saying, well, what we need to do is get together and then ask somebody else to do something. We need a new investigation into 9-11. So we've got 1,500 architects, 3,000 architects. You know, and I made this point in a couple of cases. You've got 3,000 architects in this group called Architects and Engineers from London Truth, and they're going, then going to say, well, we need a new investigation. Ah, okay, so uh, would it be FEMA that's done that? No, because they did one in 2002. Would NIST do the investigation? No, because they did one in 2005. Uh, so who else is going to do it? Oh, maybe we should do it. Oh no, we can't get involved with doing an investigation. We just sign a petition to, to ask somebody else to do it. All the while completely ignoring that Dr. Wood here, uh, she was contacted by an attorney in 2006. Cherry was contacted yeah, in 2006. And said, hang on, I've seen your research. We can actually use this to take it to court because you've Real, real evidence. You've got real, real evidence, court testable, and we can go in on this Data Quality Act and we can challenge the official reports under the Data Quality Act because this lawyer, Jeff, attorney Jerry Leapart, he knew about this Data Quality Act. I mean, I never knew about this, man. Did you, do you know about Data Quality Act? No, he, he discovered that, and uh, the fact that the NIST report was written as a government document, uh, it's a government report, which means they, it has to be true. And it, they can misinterpret things, mm -hmm. they can omit things, but they can't lie about things. In other words, they can't have a photoshopped image in there. And if they do do any photo manipulating, like lighten it, darken it, they actually put that in the caption. I mean, so, there are examples of that in the reports, aren't there? A couple, a couple of yep. places, yeah. And so, you know, without reading it, you can look at the pictures and interpret them. It's correct information. You know, they can admit stuff, but they can't include bogus stuff. And they can misinterpret it. And you, you know, you wrote this document, I think it was about, the original uh, uh, request was about 50 pages, or 55, yeah, 43. 43 pages. So what Dr. Wood did under the guidance of the attorney, she said, look, she wrote, wrote to Nest and said, your report is scientifically incorrect in at least these places, and you picked a number of areas yeah. where they got Beginning things wrong. With the title. Beginning with the title. <laughs> it wasn't a collapse. Yeah, and so that then formed the basis. In other words, you have to notify them of these errors, and then if they choose to say, uh, oh, yeah, okay, we've got it wrong, we'll correct that. In, what in that was issue. is I became a whistleblower. I, if you're the first person to uh, reveal something like this to, to a government agency, and I notified them all, of all these various errors, I became a whistleblower which qualified me to file a whistleblower case, a KETAM case. Using your expertise of right. materials engineering science, because essentially what people that wrote the reports, 
have the same technical experience or, or something similar to yeah. what Dr. Wood had been actually teaching at university level. So they should have seen what she had seen. So they had been negligent intellectually, academically, or scientifically, however you characterise it, in not, in not putting that into the report. But also, um, I, I picked apart various issues, like for example, Underwriters Lab tested uh, a replica of a full, two full floor segments and two half scale segments, and they cooked them for twice the temperature Fahrenheit for twice as long, and they didn't fail to support load. So they had to call a test because the, the floors had failed. Yet they signed off reports and fired it. That's yeah. fraud. So their model, to just clarify that or repeat it, uh, they, their model that they constructed showed that fire could not have destroyed that part of the building in, that, in the way that they claimed. Yet in the report they said that it did. Even though their own experiment, their own reproduction of it, showed that it couldn't have done it. Okay. <clears throat> There's a, this is something that's dawning on me and it's really hitting hard, is just, it's not only the sort of level they'll go to in, in destroying their own people, but this, the uh, complexity and professionalism in this cover-up. Yeah. And it, it's extraordinary. And I must say, very well done Dr. Judy for having unpicked this all and, got, and brought out the truth like this. Um, something that I, the reason I actually got in touch with Andrew, just so you know, was my, um, as a journalist, my number one focus and orientation always is the truth. Um, we don't do what we do for money. Um, and I had started uncovering a number of people in the truth movement who I considered to be potentially co-opted. Someone gave me Andrew's um, website and I started looking at his stuff and I thought, this is someone I want to talk to, he knows stuff. And that's when he came onto my radio show mm -hmm. and that's when that's right. we started talking about a uh, private conversation about who we thought um, what we thought, etc., etc. But also, we started to realise, or, or both um, express to each other our recognition of the fact that this truth movement, a huge proportion of it, as I said earlier, uh, it's not about a movement. You know, movement suggests that there's a leader, and I believe truth is more of a dynamic process. It doesn't need to go in one direction as a movement would. Well, you, you have an expression for that, don't you? Do that thing, agency. Well, that was that one, and then that movements needing. Uh, the truth movement, uh, you know, you know, cover up, cover up the needs, you know, you know the one. The truth doesn't need a movement, but a cover oh, up, cover up. Yeah, does. yeah, yeah. That's, that's the expression. In other words, the truth does right. not need a movement. Truth, truth doesn't need a movement. Only lies do. Yeah, the cover yeah. up does. What's extraordinary though is there's a lot of people who have woken up on the back of, oh my god, 9 11 was an inside job. But they've woken up to more distraction, yes. more what, distortion. What, what and that is, is if you don't like the lie behind door number one, we'll show you the lie behind door number two. And if you don't like that, we'll, we'll show you the lie behind door number three. Yeah. And so there's, they keep adding them on as needed, just so you don't turn around and look at the open field behind you. Yeah. You just keep you looking at these doors and keep you arguing about uh, ideas of opinions of whatever have nothing to do with the evidence. Like, you, it, oh yeah, they give them a list of talking points to spiel off, like um, not two buildings but three buildings. So people don't realize there were seven buildings that were destroyed that day. I didn't know it was seven buildings until I watched your presentation. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, and, and I consider myself to be quite an astute researcher. Right. right. You know, and also uh, things like the Bankers Trust building, that I think we, you know, I, I think, again, Judy brought that to my attention a few, good few years ago. The Bankers Trust building was across the road from the World Trade Center, you know, what, 100 yards, 200 yards, something like that. And it was damaged during the destruction of the towers. And there was a segment of the, uh, uh, Dr. Judy calls it wheat checks, embedded in this building. And you initially think that this, this embedded section had caused this gash in building in the Bankers Trust building. But then you realise that if you look at the relative sizes of the damage and the piece, you couldn't have done this. But the curious thing about Bankers Trust was that they repaired this structural damage following the damage to the building. And, um, and then they actually ended up uh, taking the whole building down. And it took them about... When was the repairs oh, finished in 2004, was it? Or? Hang on, I need to find the, uh, oh, that's not my, why. Favorite, my favorite uh, uh, group of, of photos. Right. Yeah, so the building was actually uh, damaged and then it was repaired 
and it took probably at least a couple of years, probably three years to finish the repairs. Oh, I'll have to get my glasses. <laughs> Right, so here's, here's the captions for the, I'll read this from page 254 of Dr. Judy Wood's book, Where Did the cows, Towers Go? And as I said on a recent presentation I did, that the NIST reports, they, they cost $16 million to produce, and they did not explain. And the bit I was going to get Judy to tell, tell them about Catherine Fletcher and the letter that she wrote to you about the um, what you said about the events up to the point of... Oh, oh, yeah, that... Um, when, when, in other words, when when we when you, she submitted a request for correction to and this... I, and I said that you, your, your explanation violates the laws of physics, you know, conservation of momentum, angular momentum, because they, they have this tipping top of Tower 2, but it turns to dust before it hits the ground. So how do they explain that? I mean, it, it, it stops tipping and it, and it turns to dust. She says, oh, well, we didn't analyze the collapse. Only the point up to the point, you know, when the building quit standing. Yeah. So it, it didn't violate the laws of physics because it was standing as long as it was still standing. Yeah, the investigator, <laughs> I think the wording in the letter was, we investigated the events up to the point of collapse. That was the thing, wasn't it? A, a, a collapse initiation where the collapse started. But, you know, right. not, not so, so in other words, the, the report was, was, was entitled The Collapse of the World Trade Center, but in this letter, after this request for correction had gone in, they claimed they didn't investigate the collapse. That was essentially what it said. Yeah, so they, they were admitted it was they admitted yeah. it was a fraud. Yeah, they actually admitted that it was a fraud. And this was so blatant. This is another thing, you know, and I've experienced this when I wrote to the Department of Health about the swine flu uh, scan. It seemed as if this Catherine Fletcher was kind of saying in a hidden way, Yeah, we know that you're right, but I can't say that officially because this was so blatantly a ridiculous thing to say that you know, she must have been sort of saying, you know, kind of I'm doing as much as I can here. I'm sorry, I can't really yeah, go further. They, they admitted that it was a fraud. And so when when it goes to the Keytown case, you have to prove it was a fraud and that you're the first one to bring it forward. End of yeah. story. Yeah. You know, it, it's already been proven it was fraud. NIST even admitted that. So that was very interesting. So we'll go back to the Bankers Trust Bill with figure 262. And we've got these pictures here. Uh, two years after 9-11-01, we've got missing floors in the building, so you've got some damage here. Yeah, but as it's, as it's, being, it's being repaired there. Okay, and then two, by 2004, it's been repaired, it was 2004, and then in 2006, the Bankers Trust, they started to dismantle the building. Yeah, it's, so it's, they repaired it and then they took it apart. Yeah, it's a 40-story building, isn't it? It's, it's a under repair, fully repaired, and then deconstruction begins. Mm. Yeah, that sequence it says it all. It's like here they, they this is what the damage was like. But they they were repairing it. They finished repairing it, and then they start taking it apart. That's and unlogical. Exactly. And the, the official explanation was that the building had got a mold infection. It's a hmm. steel frame building, and and the, and there's a very interesting thread that I think you found on a forum. And it's all about the head. So the thread on this forum is in the New York, <laughs> New York, uh, it's by it's so far New right. York, uh, uh, not New York Times. I'm trying to think. Of it's a architecture. Something. New York Architecture Forum. It's a special, special forum for people interested. But it's this in ongoing New saga yeah. of one thing after another. And this, another. this thread is, yeah, it's a, like, it started in about just after 9/11, I think, didn't it? Right. And then it's got the, all these pictures and news stories all linked in, and the whole, whole lot. Oh, um, you know who was supposed to be taking the building apart? The the uh, what the highest bidder, not the lowest bidder, the highest bidder that got, that got the job um, was the uh, John Galt company. John Galt, yeah, yeah. And uh, and then they quit, did weren't paying the employees, so the employees walked off the job. Come to think of it, uh, you know, why they, what did they do before? Not only had they not done a job like this before, they didn't exist before, or even then, they, they, this, not existing company. Yeah, this company only existed to start the deconstruction of the bankers' trust. And then, uh, then quit existing. Yeah, and they took it apart, and it took them about six years, was it? But no, then they, they, they Sorry. that company didn't do right, it. Right, okay. But, but they weren't paying their employees, so the employees walked off the job. And that, that's when it was discovered that that company didn't exist. So they got another company. And meanwhile, some pipe fell off the roof onto the firehouse below, and they had to, to um, uh, stop deconstruction for a while. And then there was a fire another time they had to stop deconstruction. Three firefighters were killed. Yeah, and there was a, they, what they were doing is they took the building down, is totally get out the building, clean out the floors, and they put 
plywood around the wall so people would fall out. And how do you get trapped in a totally gutted out open floor? But three firefighters were killed there. And what was interesting about the pictures is the plywood that was around the outside was not on fire. It was yeah. the steel that was on fire. Yeah, yeah. And this, so this, the, what, what appears to have happened to cut to the sort of chase with that one is that the Bankers Trust appeared to have had these ongoing effects after whatever happened on 9 11 happened. The, the effects were still being you know, manifested. It in, got it down to, wow. to that level where it had been damaged, and here's what the area where it had been repaired. This looks like that area, that beam looks like it's been at the bottom of the ocean for 100 years. Mm -hmm. Correct. How do you explain that? Let, let's, let's go with this dustification now, because this is something that's very fascinating. So you're saying, theoretically, uh, a new age, or, uh, um, a, a free energy weapon hit um, various parts of lower Manhattan. No, okay. I don't know about hit. It, it, there was a type of energy uh, weapon that was, system that was used. That affected, Where would it be? Where would it have been directed from? From space? From under the ground? Well, it, it, here's, here's a good analogy I like to give. Have you ever used a cell phone? <laughs> When you use your cell phone, do you know where the cell phone tower is that you're connected to? You just know that you're within range. That's all you care about is that you're within range. As it turns out, this seems like it's an interference of different types of energy fields. Okay. person who can replicate all of the same effects uses a static field, and within the static field interferes some radio frequency signal. So the static fields could be like the radio, like the um, cell phone tower coverage area, and then specifically where you want the effects, you can aim them. However, it doesn't matter where the thing's located. Okay. It just matters what it can do. You know, I mean, if we draw an analogy, uh, that sounds you know just somewhat complicated, but uh, these the, in hospitals they use MRI scanners now. It's, that means magnetic resonance imaging. And my understanding of the way that that works is you have a magnetic field, a very strong magnetic field in this chamber that you put the patient in. And then you fire a radio beam into the patient's body from, uh, you know, some radio transmitter somewhere, or maybe several of them, maybe there are a whole array of them in this it's equipment. So so, well, you obviously know more about than I do. And then the, the radio signal and the magnetic field interact, and you can pick that up on a sensor of some kind and form an image. That's magnet, you know, magnetic resonance imaging. So that, is, in essence, is a, is a type. You're using two different types of energy to create an effect. And, it, and, it, and we're not saying that, the, that this was a, you know, the subject of a giant MRI scanner in reverse. We don't know that. But what, what I'm trying to illustrate is the general principles are known and used in other areas. Okay. Uh, and I think one of the other things that, that's, that, that you've established in the book, correct me if I'm wrong, that, it, that it, this whatever's going on appears to involve something like microwave energy at some is that, yeah, that be, one, one part of it? One part of it, yeah. It's not just a microwave beam, though. No, we're not saying that. This is very important. That it's an interference of, you know, one, one type of field by itself doesn't do anything. Another one by itself doesn't do anything, but it's where they interfere. It's just like the analogy with your cell phone. Your cell phone by itself doesn't do anything. You need a tower. The tower by itself doesn't cause the communication. You need both parts working. Okay, about the dust again. Um, you said that there were effects afterwards, ongoing effects. Now, you also mentioned in your presentation yesterday that the dust particles seem to get smaller as they hit the ground and then go up. So there is obviously some prolonged effect, energetic effect thereafter. There were a number of people who died post 9-11 who were in Manhattan. Do you think that might have something to do with it? Oh, very much. Uh, the building was dustified. I mean, define that word. When you have a, a new phenomenon, you need a new word to describe it because you can't use a word that means something else. And we've not seen this before. A building turned to dust in midair. Needs a new word? Dustification. So the building was dustified. That means everything in it, up above, let's say, the 20th floor, was turned to dust. That dust had every constituent of the building in it. And if it's breaking down so that people are inhaling it, they're inhaling who knows what, you know, parts of refrigerators, parts of, of uh, metal filing cabinets, parts of um, hairspray cans, you know, everything. Human body. Yes, mm -hmm. and there was organic components in that dust, which shows it was not from high temperature. And the particle size was about a hundredth of the size of red blood cell, or approximately the size of DNA. 
that inhales right into the bloodstream. And it, perhaps it even crosses the blood brain barrier. It's, it's very fine. Masks are not going to, dust masks aren't going to keep it out. Now, just a little bit um, touching on the people. One thing, um, when people look at those pictures and you see all that dust forming, I yesterday looked at it and tears came down my face because I'm thinking that, that is the dust of thousands of people. There, there, what would have actually, what would you have imagined would have happened as those beams hit those people, or whatever it was? Do, do they suddenly disintegrate and fall into? A, what would be going on? Well, we do have various pieces of evidence from that, and looking at the pictures of the people hanging outside the buildings, I became sort of attached to a few of them and felt almost like they were communicating with me, yeah. because reading their body language, thinking about what they're thinking about, you know, here they are hanging out in the building. They want to live. They wouldn't be hanging on the outside of the building. This is, is a group of them at about the 105th floor. And you look at, you know, this one guy looks like he's taking his pants off. He's hanging by one hand and one foot on the outside of the 105th floor taking his pants off. You look and other folks have had their pants off or their shirt off. Now, why would they, you know, to step inside and take the pants. If you have some weird fetish, they just want to take his <laughs> pants off and we don't care why. And if there's smoke inside, well, take a big deep breath, step inside, take the pants off, get back outside. You know, that didn't happen. Plus, you don't see smoke coming out the windows. If I were there and I heard that there was a fire, first thing I'd do is head to the bathroom before we lost water pressure. I'd get my extra clothing, wet it down, wrap it around my head, and head for the stairs. I'd be wet. If the fire sprinklers kicked on, I'd be wet. If they didn't kick on and it was hot, I'd be sweating and I'd be wet. So there's a pretty good chance they're wet. Now, if they have to be outside the building, you want to take their pants off. Clothing protects you from fire. The only thing I can think of that would match all of that is some kind of energy field. You think of the active denial system, it's microwaving a crowd. It makes their skin feel like it's burning, and they say it's many times worse if the clothing is wet. Because, you know, you put a wet paper towel in your oven, in your microwave oven, or a dry paper towel, different things happen. The wet, the water molecules toast it. So that would be an explanation for why they'd want to take off their clothing while they're hanging outside the 105th floor. It's probably pretty cold up there with a, you know, slight breeze hanging outside the window, but also, remember, clothing protects you from, from fire. But you start realizing what had to be going on in that building. It's pretty horrendous. Um, but, you know, at first it was hard looking at the pictures of those, those folks. I won't call them jumpers, the ones who left the building early. But to, to turn away is to abandon them. These people need to be heard. They need their story told, and I felt like I made them a promise that I would tell their story because how else are we going to know? And I've talked to various you know, family members who've talked to loved ones, their loved ones who were, who were there, and it was horrendous. Um, and to realize what, you know, what, what it was. Like there's one fellow who it was racking his brain trying to figure out what happened because his wife was fine, called him on the cell phone, said, okay, I'm heading downstairs, got you know, a wet towel on the head, and uh, I'll call you when I get to the bottom. And then about two or three stories later, out the window she went. You know, it, it, he just couldn't understand it. There's not really a fire there, so what, what the deal was. If you start thinking about it, it, it is consistent with some type of energy field within the building. I think one of the analogies that you, you made, I, I did watch yesterday, and I think you, did, you, 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 you sort of uh, mentioned it, but the, the, in terms of the buildings themselves, people say, think they turn to dust in like eight seconds, and that's what it looked like, but if you look at all of the evidence, it appears that the, the buildings were kind of undergoing some process for roughly an hour before they actually, and what it seemed like is if you imagine the buildings weren't, didn't have aluminium on the outside, but they were completely made of glass, and then you could have seen the building actually being processed by this energy system inside. And then you just take away the glass walls and you imagine that all that dust would then just fall out 
on the street. Like, like if this wall of dust chasing people down the street? And that's it. When you look at that from the pictures, that's what it looks like. And you, you know, you see the, the fuming going on, or the lathering up, and the fuming going on for about an hour. Same with Building 7, except Building 7, for some reason, they did that over several hours rather than about one hour. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, you can actually begin by studying the evidence, you know, as you said, if you don't know what happened, keep a look at the evidence until you do. And you can you can see these certain stages, and those are catalogued in the book. And then to, to an extent, you know, you can't really fit it all into a two hour presentation. You can only, only do the bullet points. But you can see, for example, that it, the process appears to have started from what, what is known from the ma ma magnetometer data about what, quarter to nine or something? About 20, 20, minutes, 20 minutes ahead of time. Yeah. Yeah, and then so you can actually establish a sort of time scale for these events, which ended around about what, six, half six in the evening or something. Five, like, five, five twenty. Five twenty with the destruction of the building seven. You know, so you, you can actually establish certain events happened in a certain order, and that can then give you a clue to how it was at, how the system was working. You know, for example, it, it seems to involve something very similar to microwaves because of various characteristics. It involves some type of magnetic field. It involves some type of static electricity somewhere. Plasma. Yeah, yeah. So we we can we can say those things with quite a good degree of certainty from all the evidence that is available. When you start to move outside of that, as Dr. Wood says, she's made the case as far as the evidence allows her to do that. And you don't you don't really speculate much outside of that. If it's no, all. There's, there's no point in speculating because that doesn't take you to what you know. Mm -hmm. You know, know what you know and why you know it, and know that the rest you don't know. And, and I suppose, going back to what you were saying earlier about the grown-ups <laughs> dealing with it, you know, you would kind of hope that you know, you've done all this research, that you'd pass this on to somebody, and then they would say, oh, well, yes, I can see this, you know. But no, there is, there is no one. There is, all that we've been able to do is show this to people. And we, you know, beyond what's been done, I don't, I don't, know, I don't, I don't know what else to do. I don't know about you, Judy. I mean, yeah, I don't know how we can get more visibility, except if we have somebody who can project it further, like you folks. Yeah, yeah, and that, that appears to be how it's how it's working at the moment. I like to, I like to read my uh, quote here. In the book, show, show. That it's it's pretty important. If you listen to the evidence carefully carefully enough, it will speak to you and tell you what happened. It'll tell you exactly what happened. If you don't know what happened, keep listening to the evidence until you do. The evidence always tells the truth. The key is not to allow yourself to be distracted away from seeing what the evidence is telling you. And the whole thing with cover-ups is a distraction away from what the evidence is telling you. And the key to about everything in our lives these days is to be able to look at something, observe something, without seeing what people are telling you you're supposed to see. On that note, is there anything else that uh, you feel you want to add for enriching this interview? Um, well, I think it's just to be aware that you have to look very carefully at who is saying what and how they're saying it. And, you know, as you've done, research into their backgrounds uh, and research into other explanations that have been put forward before making your final conclusion. And it must be your conclusion, not theirs. This... Uh these pictures of the pieces turning to dust as they fall. I think that's probably the most significant Powerful. part of it. That if you, once you realize the buildings turn to dust, a lot of people say, well, you can't say an energy weapon did that unless you know what energy weapon it was, the serial number and all, to, to say you have proof that such an energy weapon exists, blah, blah, blah. But the fact that the buildings were turning to dust in midair the, the, and the buildings are gone shows that a technology that can do that does indeed exist. The, the reason why this has been covered up so powerfully is that when you look at what's in the book and what's in the presentations, it implicates there's a cover up of 9 11, or it proves there's a cover up of 9 11, it proves there's a cover up of free energy technology, and it also proves there's a cover up about the climate and all the climate change thing. And you look at all the evidence with Hurricane Emma, which I haven't had time to cover in this interview. So all these, those three things are going to get, you know, revised completely, and it will check that will that, that those three things together will completely change the world we live in when a new understanding is developed of those things. 9-11 seems to be such a, a big linchpin in this whole sort of conspiracy realm, but what people don't realise is how much it really can reveal if uh, we look at the evidence. Right. And um, it's not a conspiracy. 
It's not a conspiracy not. is about who conspired yeah. with whom to plan to do an illegal act. And, and I'm not talking about who did what in committing crime, I'm just talking about evidence. So it can't be a conspiracy. I love that. All right. Brilliant. Um, Andrew and Dr. Dewey, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks, Thanks and, for getting this information out. It is an honour and a privilege to do so, honestly, and um, your information has just been absolutely eye-opening right from the first time I started looking at it, so thank you for putting it out, and um, we hope to speak to you more again, and thanks again, Andrew, for speaking to us again. You're welcome. Thank you.